In the past two decades, digital technology has been increasingly dominating our lives and the way we carry out various day-to-day -day tasks. The COVID-19 crisis has made most of us turn to our technology for school, work, socializing, and entertainment. With such high reliance on technology, there ought to be some influence on our psychology and even anatomy, right? While there are positive effects of digital technology in that it enables a lot of us to continue working and stay connected during this time, the dependence on technology has already brought about a lot of negative impacts. And this is something researchers have been trying to understand. We are also hearing about a term called Zoom fatigue. So then why is it relevant for us to understand the impact of digital technology uh, on our cognitions and behavior? We know that when we are exposed to an environmental stimulus over a period of time in increasing frequencies, our brain, which is plastic in nature, undergoes changes through neural branching, neurogenesis, and maybe even neural pruning of regions we no longer use. The same way, our dependence on technology to carry out a lot of tasks for us, such as remembering a phone number, or a friend's birthday, or even telling us when World War II started and ended, even though we learned that in school yesterday, there are bound to be changes in cognitive processes and behaviors too. This unit uh, aims to understand our psychology in the digital era. You yourselves have been working on a month-long project exploring the impact digital technology has on various topics that you have chosen for yourself. Mental health, learning, multitasking, sleep, self-esteem, and so on. If we had to understand the areas of focus in this unit in a nutshell, it urges us to understand the positive and negative influences digital technology has on our cognitive processing, the reliability of our cognitive processing, and also our emotions. In addition, it urges us to understand novel or new research methods that are being introduced in order to better understand the interaction between digital technology and human cognitions. As for a few examples um, of questions that can come for this unit, um, this might help you kind of understand the research that I'm going to go over a little better. And again, one more thing to keep in mind is that all extension questions are LAQ, they are never SAQ. So a question could be, discuss the influence of digital technology on cognitive processing. When you're asked a question like this, you would have to focus on both the positive aspects and the negative aspects or influences um, that technology has on cognitive processing, such as memory, decision making, creativity, language, and so on. Um, another question that can come is, to what extent does digital technology have a positive influence on emotions and cognition? then to what extent does digital technology have a negative influence on the reliability of cognition? And finally, evaluate methods used to study the interaction between digital technology and cognitive processes. Again, these are just a few examples. They can switch it around with different command terms and different focuses, and it can also be just cognitive processing in general, where you can talk about reliability or you can talk about improvement and positive um, influence or negative influence. And sometimes it can be as specific as emotions and cognition, which is a subtopic in this unit. So the first part um, that we will be addressing is the impact digital technology has on cognitive processes. A good question to consider when addressing this part of the unit is, does my use of technology improve or worsen my cognitive skills? And again, these cognitive skills can be your memory, your decision making, um, your reasoning, your thinking and learning, and also language and creativity. Rosser et al. conducted a correlational research to investigate the relationship between video games and surgical performance. 
we know video games uh, often get a lot of negative reviews from, especially from parents who think that uh, it is addictive and it is taking you away from uh, spending more time learning and studying. But do video games do have an impact or uh, have a positive impact on our learning and our cognitive processes? Okay, so 33 laparoscopic surgeons were the participants of this research. Laparoscopic surgery is the insertion of a thin tube with a camera into either the abdomen or pelvic region with the purpose of diagnosing or treatment. So this procedure uh, is a specific surgical procedure and like other surgical procedures, it requires a lot of precision, attention, and fine motor, motor skills. The researchers asked the participants to begin with whether they played video games. And if they did, they tested their video game experience through self-reported questionnaires and also the participants' video game mastery by making them play three games for 25 minutes. And after they played those ga games for 25 minutes, the researchers drew a final score, which then reflected the participants' mastery of the game, or of gaming in general. The participants were then assessed on a series of standardized simulation tasks and drills that are common in surgical training. They used this as a measure of understanding the participants' surgical performance, which was the dependent variable. One such task was inserting a needle through a triangle, as you can see in the diagram, uh, and they had to use their non-dominant hand. So if you are a right-handed person, you'd have had to use your left hand, and if you were left-handed, you'd have to use your right hand. Um, and what they had to do was, using that needle, they had to carry um, the triangle from point A to point B um, using their non-dominant hand. The researchers through these tasks found that the surgeons who played video games for more than three hours a week had 37% lesser errors during surgery and even performed surgery 27% faster than those who played less than that or not at all. This is an exciting um, finding because it is in support of video games um, and positive impact of video games. This then, the research then, explains that just playing a video game is not enough um, for you to have any significant impact on your cognitive processing, but rather that when we have a certain level of mastery by playing video games regularly, um, their fine, um, the participants' fine motor skills and attention improved. And that these skills that they had got from playing video games were being transferred into their skills as surgeons. And again, that improved their surgical performance in terms of how many errors they made and also how long they took doing the procedure. But the relationship between digital technology and the performance, um, the surgical performance, was only correlational, which means that there may be several third variable factors um, that can influence this relationship. And furthermore, there was some reliance on self-reports of experience playing video games, which could allow for biases in the procedure and demand characteristics. And the tasks that were tested, um, first, they were not actual surgical procedures. They were not actually conducting surgery. They were just mock procedures or simulations of um, skills that they require or learn. Um, and also, these tasks were highly specific, uh, and they were based on fine motor skills and attention. So we don't really know if this applies to broader cognitive processes such as thinking, decision-making, learning, and memory. A possibly more relatable research is one conducted by Sanchez. He aimed to investigate the influence of playing first-person shooter games such as Counter-Strike and Halo uh, and how that may have an influence or if that may have an influence on the science learning and comprehension of 60 university students. 
These students were first uh, divided into two groups, an independent measures design. Um, the first group played Halo, which is a first-person shooter game that requires you to navigate around a map and react to different situations. Um, and again, it involves also spatial reasoning and decision making. Group two, on the other hand, played Word Womp, which is a word search game, hence only relating to language skills. After playing these games, the participants were then made to read a 3,500-word th uh, text on tectonic plates, and this text had no illustrations or images to aid the comprehension of the participants. So it would be a pretty dry reading, if I had to say so. <laughs> After they read the, task, uh, the text, the participants were then asked to write an essay on what causes Mount St. Helena, or St. Helens, which is a volcano, to erupt. The researchers found that those who played the FPS game performed better in the essay. The researchers explained that reading the text without images requires participants to encode verbal information and convert it to abstract spatial representations. Although the skills required in playing an FPS game are slightly different, it seems that the skills acquired by playing games can be generalized to their um, ability to use spatial reasoning um, to understand the, the text and write on and also generalize it to how they understand the eruption of a volcano. While this research addresses more general cognitive processes um, such as verbal encoding and spatial reasoning, the results could be confounding by participant variability and individual differences, since again it was an individual measures design. The procedure is also quite artificial and the impact of playing video games is questionable. Is it truly possible to acquire those skills and generalize them within the span of this experiment? We don't know that these participants played Halo or Word Womp before or whether they play other FPS games. Um, so it is difficult to really make that kind of conclusion um, based on the fact that they played this game maybe for the first time uh, and only for the duration of this experiment. And does that really have an effect on their skills is again questionable. With all of these extraneous variables, the internal validity of this research can be quite low. These two researchers have highlighted possible pos uh, positive influences and improvements technology can have on cognitive processing. And there are several other researches that support the idea. But at the same time, there are negative impacts technology has on us. And one such impact is of the Google effect and its impact on our memory. The, Go the Google effect, also known as digital amnesia, is the tendency to forget information that can be found readily online by using an internet search engine. At the same time, it has been found that it improves our ability to remember where to retrieve information and find information we'd come across previously. So if I had found a blog on my travel or my intention to travel to, um, I don't know, Australia, I might remember the location of where I found it, which may be like Pinterest, okay? Um, and I might not remember what the article said in terms of the information that was dispensed in that article, but I will remember that I found it on Pinterest and I would be able to easily find my way back to that article um, based on my understanding of the location of where I can find it. So Sparrow and his colleagues uh, have conducted extensive research on the Google effect uh, and how that influences um, memory. They have, again, conducted several researches about three to four experiments in 2011. Uh, I will be going over two of their researches that have had some interesting findings. So again, a lot of the participants, all of the participants were university students and a majority of the procedure required them to um, read out trivia facts, okay, 
and then enter it onto a data um, sheet on a computer. So the first study used a two by two independent measures design. Okay, so the participants were still in two different groups, but within the groups there were also two different conditions. Okay, so in this first experiment, the participants had to read out 40 trivia uh, facts and enter it onto a computer. What was the difference between the two groups and the conditions within those groups was um, one group was told that the information that they were reading out and were um, typing into the computer would be saved, okay, and that they would be able to access it later. And the other group was told that the information that they were entering would not be saved, rather it would be erased. Okay, So those were the two different groups. One group had the information that their information would be saved, uh, and the other group had uh, been told that the information they're typing in would be erased. So they would not have access to that information later on in the experiment. Within the group, half the participants were told to remember these facts. So they were told that they should be paying attention and try remembering the task, um, the, the trivia facts. And the other half of the group were told nothing. So they were not told to remember um, explicitly by the researchers. Okay, And this was the same for both the groups. Half of the participants were told to remember the facts, the other half were told nothing. So what the researchers found in terms of how many trivia facts the participants remembered um, was that participants who were told to remember um, the trivia facts did not in fact perform better than those who were told nothing. Okay, You can see that here 19 and here 22 facts were remembered, 29 and 31 facts were remembered. So being told to remember a certain fact had no impact on whether they remembered it or not. And looking at the two groups, the participants who were told that the information would be saved and they'd be able to access it later uh, did in fact perform worse in terms of how many facts they remembered correctly. Okay, uh, In both the conditions, they remembered 19 facts and 22 facts, which is lesser then those participants were told that their information is going to be erased and would not have access to it. These participants remembered 29 facts out of 40 facts and 31 facts out of 40 facts, which is definitely higher than those. So here you can see that knowing that you will have access to information, again, can make us lazy in terms of we put in lesser effort uh, into trying to really remember that information because we know that we will be able to just search it up on Google and, under, um, and access that information again. So the second research um, used 30 trivia facts and what they were trying to understand was whether we recall um, the information itself better or whether we recall where the location of the information is. So. Um, basically where we can find that information. Yeah, so the participants again had to follow the same procedure. They read out 30 trivia facts and they entered it into a data system on a computer. But when they entered each fact, they got a feedback from the computer saying that their, um, their fact or their data was saved into a folder, folder X. And this folder X could be six different folders and the participants were not told um, that there would be these six folders, okay? But they were told if it was folder um, one, folder two, folder three, right? So they were told, uh, the computer would tell them which folder that particular fact had been saved in, okay? Uh, after the, they finished entering the data into the system, the participants were asked to recall all their facts that they could remember, okay? But the more important part was the participants were, after remembering the facts, the participants were given uh, parts of the fact, okay, and asked where they had stored that information or where the computer had stored that information, so which folder. Uh, and 
what the researchers did find was that the participants were most likely to remember which folder the trivia fact was saved in correctly over actually remembering the facts. And in this research, um, the second experiment, we see that because the information was going to be saved anyways, participants put lesser effort into remembering um, the information or the fact in itself as opposed to trying to remember where they would be able to access it, which folder they would be able to access it in uh, if they were asked to remember or asked a question about that fact. Okay? This research is applicable to real life. Uh, we do struggle remembering basic information like birth dates, addresses, and telephone numbers, and also rely on our devices highly to um, keep track of this. But this research has issues with ecological validity. The participants were aware that they were part of an experiment and hence may have engaged in demand characteristics. The information that they were exposed to also has limited value to them as students. Uh, why, like, what use would trivia facts be to their learning process or their personal life? So this again could have resulted in them putting in minimal effort into remembering the trivia facts. Furthermore, we know that we encode and store information into our long-term store best when we analyze it semantically, which is by associating meaning to it, or when information is of personal relevance to us. Neither of those two var variables were considered in this procedure, which makes it difficult to transfer the findings of this experiment um, and this research to real-life situations. So these are the three researches that are in support of positive impact and in support of negative impacts that technology can have on um, cognitive processes. What you're going to do next is continue working on your research proposal, okay? It is going to be a written proposal. It's not going to be on the poster that we usually use. It has to be in a Word document, but you will still use the components of those um, like in terms of aim, hypotheses, independent variable, dependent variable, your research method and your research design. So those are the things that you will write about and your document, your proposal, should be easy enough for me to understand how your research is going to be exactly. Okay, so imagine that you're writing to a person who understands research method to a certain extent, but you still need to outline why you're choosing a certain method why are you using such a certain sampling technique um, and what your procedure is going to be? Okay, what are you going to do first? What is the ethical procedures that you need to follow? Um, how are you going to get participants? What is the sampling technique? Okay, so that is what you're going to focus on working on for the rest of class. And you will have Monday also to finish off your research um, proposal, but the research proposal will be due that night. So you have today's, the rest of today's class and Monday's class to finish working on that aspect of your project.